For a brief period in time, the company known as Fairbanks Morse actually dabbled in locomotive manufacturing. They made multiple different models of diesel locomotives, but for various reasons, they never really took off, and they would exit the market as quickly as they had entered it. Why didn't Fairbanks Morse ever become known as a solid diesel manufacturer? Why did their locomotives just not sell? Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains opposed. And today, we are going to discuss Fairbanks Morse and Company. As I said, for a brief period, they did manufacture some locomotives, but they uh, didn't really do much in terms of the, the locomotive industry. Why not? This is the reason why Fairbanks Moore stopped making locomotives. Fairbanks Morse and Company actually dates back to 1823. They are a very, very old company. They were founded in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, when an inventor, Thaddeus Fairbanks, opened an ironworks facility to manufacture two of his own patented inventions, a cast iron plow, as well as a heating stove. Then, in 1829, he started a hemp dressing business, for which he himself built the machinery. The company wasn't successful in fabricating four fiber industries, but another invention of his, a platform scale, formed the basis for a phenomenally profitable enterprise. The device was patented in June of 1832, and a few years later, with his brother Erastus Fairbanks, the company was selling thousands of scales, first in the US, and then later exported to Europe, South America, and even Imperial China. They were very good scales, and they won 63 medals over the years in international competitions. They became the leading manufacturer in general in the United States, as well as the best known company in the world, right up until Henry Ford founded the Ford Corporation and assumed that title in the 1920s. So yeah, they were doing really well. Then in Wisconsin, a former missionary named Leonard Wheeler designed an innovative and durable windmill that was used to pump water, known as the Eclipse Windmill. He set up shop in Beloit just after the Civil War was over, and soon half a million windmills dotted the landscape throughout the West, as well as as far away as Australia. At that same time, a Fairbanks and Company employee, Charles Hosmer Morse, opened a Fairbanks office in Chicago, Illinois. From there, he expanded the territory of operation and widened their own product line. As a part of that, he brought Wheeler, as well as his windmill, into business with the company. Due to his astonishing success, Morse himself was made a partner with the company, and by the end of the 19th century, the whole company was known as Fairbanks Morse and Company, and their headquarters was in Chicago. Canadian and American cities had branch dealerships, with Fairbanks first coming to Montreal, Quebec, Canada in 1876 and opening a factory there. Fairbanks Morse was set for success, and into the late 19th century, they continued expanding their product lines. Into the 1900s, they began to include typewriters, hand truck, railway velocipedes, pumps, tractors, warehouse and bulk shipping tools, if you could name it, Fairbanks Morse probably manufactured it at one point or another. They became an industrial supplier, distributing complete turnkey systems. Tools, plumbing, gauges, gaskets, parts, valves, and pipe. Their catalog in 1910 alone contained over 800 pages. They were doing solid work. They made quality products that people enjoyed using, so the success was certainly earned. They would even start producing radios in 1934, and still later tried out automobiles, tractors, corn shellers, hammer mills, cranes, televisions, and even refrigerators, but they never made too many products in those particular markets. Other companies had already solidified themselves elsewhere, and competition was steep. Fairbanks Morse couldn't produce everything. But they still made enough, and where they really broke ground in terms of innovation was engines. They began producing oil and naphtha engines in the 1890s. 
When they purchased the Charter line of engines, which were the first commercially available gas engines, their thought, at least at the time, was that an engine could be used as a backup power for when one of their Eclipse windmills wasn't getting any wind. And their gas engines became a big success with farmers as a result. Electricity generation and oil field work also utilized these engines, and as engines in general became more commonplace, replacing the windmills entirely in some capacities, Fairbanks Morse's product line continued to evolve. Small lighting plants built by the company were also popular, and they tried out kerosene engines in 1893, coal gas in 1905, and then they moved to semi-diesel engines in 1913, as well as full diesel engines in 1924. Their Model N was popular in stationary industrial applications, for example. They had actually entered the large engine business in 1912, when Rudolf Diesel's American license expired. He was a German inventor and mechanical engineer who is famous for having invented the diesel engine. With the expiration of his license, other companies could also manufacture diesel engines without paying him. Thus, their Model Y semi-diesel became a standard in the industry. Sugar, rice, timber, and mine mills used the engine. The Model Y was available in sizes from one through six cylinders, and the YVA engine was the first high-compression cold-start full diesel developed by them without the acquisition of any foreign patents. It was developed in Beloit and introduced in 1924. Moving forward, they continued to push into marine engine building and became a major engine manufacturer. During World War I, a large order for 60 of the 30 horsepower CO marine engines were installed in British decoy fishing ships to lure German submarines within range of their 6-inch naval guns. In 1939, Fairbanks Morse developed a marine engine using an unusual opposed piston design. This is very relevant to the future of this story. Fairbanks Morse made good products generally, but they really enjoyed opposed piston diesel engines. An opposed piston engine is distinctive because each cylinder has a piston at both ends and no cylinder head at all. There are some advantages to doing it this way. By eliminating the cylinder head as well as the valve train, it reduces the weight, complexity, cost, heat loss, and friction loss of the engine. It also creates a uniflow scavenged movement of gas throughout the combustion chamber. That avoided drawbacks that were associated with the contemporary crossflow scavenge designs. And the engine could be shorter, giving them extra space to, well, do whatever they want. If an opposed piston design sounds familiar to you, well, my British fans are probably like, wait, the Deltic? And yes, the Napier Deltic engine is indeed an opposed piston design. A bit more complex than a standard one because of its triangular nature, but it is an opposed piston engine. But the opposed piston engines aren't perfect, they do have drawbacks. Mostly due to the fact that the power from the two opposing pistons have to be geared together. So despite the fact that the engine design reduced weight without a head or valve train, the added complexity of the gearing system added weight, so they were still heavy and complex, but in a slightly different way. But they can work, and were proven to work. Fairbex Morse did not invent the design, but they certainly helped develop it quite a bit. U.S. Navy fleet submarines often used Fairbanks Morse opposed piston designs, partially due to the fact that they were shorter. They took up less space, and on a submarine, you needed as much space as possible. Smaller engine, but still with decent power output? Yeah, that's a win for them. But we're here for the locomotives. After all, they're making diesel engines. Why couldn't they make engines for locomotives? Why couldn't they just make their own locomotives? They certainly had experience building stuff and, well, they did try. Shortly after they won their first US Navy contract, they introduced their five inches bore by six inches stroke opposed piston diesel to the railway industry. That engine was installed in several self-propelled rail cars, but it was unreliable and it was superseded by a larger five-cylinder, eight inches bore by 10 inches stroke engine that produced 800 horsepower. That was put into the OP-800 rail cars in 1939. And by that point, they were already into their long-term plan to build locomotives in-house, which was initiated in 1935. 
They hired an electrical engineer, John K. Stoltz, from Westinghouse Electric Corporation specifically to work on these projects, and they developed plans for a 1,000 horsepower switcher and a 2,000 horsepower multi-purpose locomotive. It was good timing for them because they already had experience making engines, and it was looking like railways might start to completely replace steam and use diesel locomotives instead. And even though they weren't actually a part of the industry, they did desperately want to be because, well, that meant more money for them. In fact, they were ready to begin production of their units in 1940, but that was into World War II. The War Production Board denied permission for them to do that, as the national interest of Fairbanks Morse's production was of their submarine engines. The locomotive market was already supplied by existing manufacturers. They didn't need Fairbanks Morse doing that, especially when they needed them to be making engines for submarines. So Fairbanks Morse had to wait a few years until 1943 when the War Production Board finally approved their plans to sell locomotives. They introduced the 1,000 horsepower switcher, the H-10-44, in 1944 which was followed by the 2,000 horsepower cab unit, dubbed the Erie Built due to the fact that it was outsourced to a different assembly location in late 1945. But their early locomotives weren't very good. They proved very unreliable. The high stress of railroad service actually exposed weaknesses in Fairbanks Morse's engines. They've been building engines for submarines, not locomotives. And submarines didn't actually stress their diesel engines quite as hard as trains tended to. So naturally, they didn't sell very well, and in 1947, Fairbanks Morse reorganized their locomotive division and hired new managers. They also built a dedicated factory the following year, which would have been a very big investment, but they were quite serious about getting into this market. That same year, they introduced two new road switcher models, the 1500 horsepower H-15-44 and the 2000 horsepower H-20-44. Neither of these sold particularly well, with the H-20-44 being noted as just not being very flexible. It could only be used for certain things. In late 1949, the company's new cab units, which were named the Consolidated Line, were introduced to replace the Erie Bilts in their own catalog. But this line failed flat on its face, partially due to the fact that cab units were falling out of favor on American railroads at the time. But Fairbanks Morse wasn't done just yet. They were still willing to give it a try. Yeah, they were being outcompeted by everyone else. EMD was crushing them. Alco was doing better than them in this market, seriously. So in 1951, they began designing a new large locomotive, and this one was supposed to be built to impress. Introduced in 1953, it would become the 2,400 horsepower H-24-66 Train Master, which was a very, very nice looking high hood unit diesel. At the time of its introduction, it was the highest powered locomotive available. So you'd think they would have done really well, and yeah, they were powerful, but they didn't sell very well at all. They built their last locomotive for the American market in 1958, and they made their final delivery to a Mexican customer in 1963. In total, Fairbanks Morris only ever sold 1,460 diesel locomotives, which was, frankly, in the span of time they were at it, kind of pathetic. Only 1,460 diesel sales in 20 years of doing this? That's, that's horrible. That, that's absolutely atrocious, but why? Fairbanks Morris was so good at everything else. They had done really well in pretty much every conceivable category. What was it about locomotives that threw them off so bad? Well, it was down to the engines. Remember I said the opposed piston engine thing was very important? Yeah, see, no one else really used the opposed piston engines in locomotives at the time. Now, you might be saying, but they're shorter. They should be better for being put in locomotives. And yeah, technically their advantages would seemingly be pretty good for a locomotive, but A, early on, we've already identified the problem that their engines were built for submarines, which do not have the same level of shocks and stresses that happen on a locomotive. 
therefore failures were common. But even when they worked that out, opposed piston engines are not maintained in the same way as a regular diesel engine. Railway maintenance workers were used to the regular diesel engines, and the opposed pistons needed a different touch. They needed time to get used to them. But why should they bother when their advantages weren't actually really helping the railway that much? There was nothing about Fairbanks Morse's locomotives that necessarily showed how much better an opposed piston design was outside of, what, saving space? That seems better for the manufacturer, not necessarily for the railway. And the railway workers would have to learn how to maintain this whole new non-standard engine when both Alco and EMD, and later General Electric, were using the standard type of diesel engines which they were used to and understood how they worked. Maintenance was therefore kind of a pain on Fairbanks Morse's designs, and given they were a minority, it was very easy for railways, who started to struggle in the 50s, to say, why would we spend money on something that was going to be more expensive to maintain? It was as simple as that. Maintenance took longer because they didn't know how the opposed piston stuff worked. So why bother dealing with it? No matter how good the train master may have been in practice, maintenance costs are maintenance costs. And thus, Fairbanks Morse's diesel locomotive division fell flat on their face, and they chose to leave that element of the industry. But Fairbanks Morse didn't go away. Unlike all the other companies I've talked about so far, they didn't die as a result of their foray into the locomotive market. Probably because, well, they were never known as the locomotive manufacturer in the first place. They had other products that they were known for. They could lean on that and just continue on as they had been, which is pretty much exactly what they did. They continued to build diesel and gas engines. They were known for that, and their engines were good in certain applications, just not on locomotives. But Eric Morse couldn't last forever, necessarily. I mean, they, they kind of did, sort of. But they had some problems, and they started having a downsize. See, yes, they made engines, and that was good, but a lot of their engines, and their windmills actually, just started becoming obsolete or in less demand. The windmills just stopped selling. No one needed those anymore. They were too old. And low-cost electricity from the grid eliminated the need for local power production by small and medium diesel engines, so Fairbanks Moore stopped selling those as much too. A lot of their engines kept working until the late 20th century, but the widespread availability of the modern electrical grid was far too much competition for them to deal with. They actually suffered an inter-family feud for control of the company in 1956 between the sons of Charles Morse. That overall weakened the company as well. They continued sliding downhill for the next few decades. The regional sales offices were closed, and the one-shop model no longer appealed to buyers in the new consumer age. Automakers, tractor makers, and locomotive builders started actually moving into Fairbanks Morse's market share. Where Fairbanks Morse had tried to move into theirs before, the others were much more successful about taking away their market. The company spiraled out of control and eventually was sold. They merged with the Penn Texas Corporation in 1958, and that formed Fairbanks Whitney Corporation. Then they were reorganized as Colt Industries in 1964. In 1988, the Fairbanks Morse Pump Division was sold off to private investors to become Fairbanks Morse Pump. Then it was subsequently purchased by Pentair as part of an acquisition of General Signal Pump Group in 1997. In 1988, the scale business was sold off by Cold Industries and became Fairbanks Scales, which is still an independent company, to be fair. In 1990, Colt Industries sold its firearms business to CF Holdings Corp. as Colt's manufacturing company, Incorporated, and became Coltec Industries, Inc., which later became a subsidiary of Enpro Industries, Inc., Enbro was then the parent company of Fairbanks Morse Engine until January 21st, 2020, when Fairbanks Morse was sold again to Arcline Investment Management. Are you are you are you keeping track of all this, or do I have to re-explain it? Because I don't want to. As a result, there are now three different companies using either the Fairbanks or Fairbanks Morse trademarks with lineage to the original Fairbanks Morse and Company. The one that makes the engines, the one that makes the scales, and the one that makes the pumps. They're all separate now, for reasons that I just don't... It, corporate management. There, there you go. Anyway, so yes, while technically Fairbanks Morse is still around in, in three different versions, it, it's only because they just kind of 
stumbled into this. Like, they wound up basically failing and being sold off, but their name is still utilized in some capacities. And I don't know if I can call that a success. They certainly failed with locomotives, but in other avenues, they were really good. They just couldn't keep up with the times in some ways. But they still make scales and pumps. And to be fair, some of their engines are still utilized for smaller needs. And weirdly, they actually make Alco designed diesel engines now, as that arm of the company got the rights to them. So there's something weird for you. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, Subdue 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson, 1 Day 1 232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac 81, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust the Third, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Lord Hoff 444, Alaric Jaspers, The Baxter, That Guy with a Beard, Mark Holding, Luck Kraken, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Ohio Trucker 1, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hudson 2860, Icerfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, and Dr. Racer 78. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.